All right, thanks. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to present this, to discuss this paper. Um, so just to kind of bring, just kind of motivate, I guess, the question a little bit. Uh, recently, we have been thinking of using uncertainty as a fundamental driver of quantities and prices. And there's been quite a bit of work uh, on this field. And people have thought about different types of uncertainty. You know, people have thought about you know, political, uh, political uncertainty, which, you know, I argue is extremely topical right now. And by the way, can someone explain to me why the VIX is low? Um, other people have thought about movements in return volatility as a source of risk in financial markets. People have thought about the term structure of variance risk premia, and people like Amir and his co-authors have thought about good and bad uncertainty. But all of this stuff mostly focuses on uncertainty about aggregate outcomes. What this paper does is to focus on uncertainty about firm-specific outcomes. So why would that matter? Well, whenever I teach the CAPM, I always have the following problem. It's convincing people that idiosyncratic risk doesn't matter. Just somehow, it just seems counterintuitive to students. And you know what? Maybe they're right. So, you know, there, I think there can think of plenty of reasons why idiosyncratic firm outcomes may affect how people make decisions. And for example, in this particular paper, the channel that uh, Winston focuses on is some type of moral hazard where you give basically insiders are undiversified stake. And since these people are risk averse, uncertainty about the firm will basically affect how they behave. And you know, this is kind of consistent with earlier work uh, that Rene did and I had done some earlier work on the subject. It's also related to work by Heaton and Lucas where they argue that the fact that people are exposed to other types of idiosyncratic risk may affect how they're willing to invest in the markets. Okay, so here's what this paper does. The question it asks, it's actually pretty ambitious. It says, in general, how is uncertainty priced in general equilibrium? Okay, so it tries to be a, a very general model of uncertainty. And since it's a general model, the answer that it yields, it's basically it depends. It depends on the type of uncertainty. That is, is it uncertainty about the firm's growth prospects or is it uncertainty about the firm's assets in place? It also depends on how well risk is shared between agents. So overall, I thought it was a really nice paper. It's very deep and complicated. So it took me some time to kind of figure out what's going on. So what I'll try to do is, part of the discussion is try to kind of explain to you how I understand the paper. I think part of the issue is there's a lot of moving parts. So I'll try to do is kind of isolate each part and tell you which pieces I thought were important and I'll ignore the ones that I didn't understand or I thought were not important. So the way I understand the paper is as combining elements from two distinct literatures. So there's a literature I'm familiar with, which I've worked, um, where there are models where you have productivity shocks that affect assets in place of the firm and growth opportunities differently. Think of it as technology shocks that are only embodied in new capital goods. And in equilibrium, these two types of shocks can be priced differently. And one of the insights that we had in our last paper we learned it is that risk sharing, how risk is shared by existing agents can actually affect the pricing of these shocks. Another relatively dis like literature that comes from a very different end is a world where due to some type of friction, a subset of agents is forced to hold a disproportionate amount of risk. And as a result, how risk is priced is gonna depend on the net worth of these agents. So in the model, these agents are called experts. We're gonna discuss how they map to reality. So that's kind of, you know, think of it as an intersection of these two literatures and talking about uncertainty. So the model has a lot of element, a lot of parts, what I thought the important ones. The first element is obviously idiosyncratic risk. So there are basically two types of risk that is specific to the firm. One is simply, a, think of it as a capital depreciation shock. We have some assets in place and randomly they receive productivity shocks that are basically IID over time. What's changing over time is the conditional variance of these shocks. Okay, so think of it as like a dispersion in existing productivity across firms. Now, in a world where everyone was diversified, these things would not affect anyone's decision. Here, because the experts are forced to hold a fraction of the firm's idiosyncratic risk, which we'll see in a slide, what it does is they actually affect the firm's investment decisions. Although SQL, they'll invest less when uncertainty about 
productivity increases. So that's the first piece. The second piece is that Winston has uncertainty about the firm's future growth prospects. And the way to think about it is that every period, a firm gets tapped on the shoulder whether it gets to invest or not. If you get tapped by the Calibo Ferry, what happens is you get also get drawn uh, another shock, Epsilon, which determines the productivity of the new project that you get to invest in. And because there are decreasing returns to scale, what you get to do is you're going to choose a level of investment that's convex in that productivity shock. So think about it is if you have resources that are scarce and ideas that are different in quality, what you want to do is you want to allocate the most resources to the best ideas. As I increase the dispersion of ideas, this is going to increase overall output. Okay? So that's a pretty standard effect. Um, I would call it like the O.E. Hartman Apple effect in a somewhat different setting. Now, what happens here is that as I increase the dispersion in epsilon, so if I have a second moment, to, a second moment shock to epsilon, this is going to become a first moment shock to epsilon to some power that's greater than one. So this is going to increase the average amount of investment. And because every firm is identical, that is, each period, each firm draws an IID shock, the average firm is going to basically be the same as each firm, or rather, each firm is going to be basically the same as the average firm. OK, so that's the second uh, source of uncertainty. And the question is, what happens, or how do these two types of increasing these two uh, dispersions affect the stochastic discount factor? So for that, you need a general equilibrium model. So he has that. And then the new insight there, the, the new element there, is some type of intermediation friction. So in the model, you have households that cannot invest in the stock market directly. But they can only do so through some type of intermediary or expert. But there's a moral hazard problem because the expert can shirk, or they can steal cash, or they cannot work as hard to find new projects. So what you end up doing is you have to give the expert an undiversified stake. OK, now what this means now is that each expert needs to hold an amount, a dollar amount, that's independent of his wealth and only depends on the firm that he's assigned to or she's assigned to. As the expert becomes richer, that part is become, going to become a smaller fraction of her wealth. And therefore, it's going to matter less for her investment decisions. When the expert is poor, then the part that's tied up to the firm is going to be a big part of her wealth. And therefore, whatever happens to the firm is going to affect the expert a lot. Of course, if the expert's wealth falls below that threshold, she can quit and become a regular household. So that's the mechanism by which the amount of risk that gets shared depends, or rather, how people respond to that risk depends on their net worth. So that's a kind of a similar um, mechanism as in Zigo and Arvin's papers, where how much you basically you're willing to take on risk depends on how much of the risk you're forced to hold. OK, so there's that in the background. Now, the cost of having this and to keep the model tractable is that the, the expert's portfolio choice cannot be different. Everyone needs to have the same portfolio to basically get the model to aggregate. So what Winston does is to allow firms to retrade. So at each point in time, each firm is kind of conditionally identical. Like we all agree to trade assets in place and trade growth options until we're basically the same. OK, so these are the two elements. Now, as I said before, the, how sensitive the expert is to what happens to the firm depends on her wealth. If she's poor, whatever happens to the wealth translates almost one to one into her consumption. If she's rich, whatever happens to the firm affects her consumption only a small amount. Now, what happens to the economy as you increase the idiosyncratic risk, that is dispersion each, either of these two productivity shocks, when now suddenly, if the experts are collectively poor, they're going to get very divergent consumption paths. So they're going to get, for example, if the productivity shock increases, the, this is going to increase the variance of their future consumption paths. So the future is going to become worse. If the growth uncertainty shock increases, it's actually going to make the variance increase, but also the skewness, because now not every expert is going to benefit. Only the ones that get to get tapped by the Calvo Ferry benefit. And there's also a convexity effect. So then uh, this is going to lead to very divergent paths. 
So what happens is basically the same thing as a Duffy-Constantinidis effect, but with a kind of forward-looking consumption path. So instead of having people's instantaneous consumption growth, the dispersion of that changing, what you see is the dispersion in their entire paths. So all else equal, if that effect dominates, then people are going to feel unhappy. And they will basically want to buy insurance against those state of the world. OK? So just to recap, in a state of the world where the experts are rich, whatever happens to the firm does not have a big impact on their wealth and in their future consumption. So in that side of the world, the productivity and certainty shock gets priced negatively because it lowers investment decisions a little bit. Whereas the growth and certainty shock is priced positively because now you have a bigger menu of ideas. You have, you know, the, the average idea is better, or like the, the, average benef the average output produced is higher. The average investment is higher, so it leads to higher investment and higher future consumption. So in equilibrium, that shock will get a positive price of risk. By contrast, when agents are poor, when the experts are poor, then whatever happens to their firm affects their wealth very um, a lot. So then you have the Duffy Constantinidis effect potentially dominating, which basically pushes both shocks to have a negative price of risk. So here's how to see it graphically. Here's the price of the um, growth uncertainty shock on the left, the price of the productivity uncertainty shock to the right. You see on the right, the price is always negative because it's bad. There's really no upside. But it's worse when experts are poor. The growth uncertainty shock, the price is positive. When experts are rich, that is whatever happens to the firm doesn't really matter. So the only thing that happens is it increases average consumption and investment. Whereas when experts are poor, Aggregate investment consumption still increased, but at the same time, you have the duffy constantinidis effect where people basically feel that the, 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 the distribution of future consumption paths are different. Okay, so here are my comments. So I think the model has way too many moving parts. For example, I couldn't really figure out why, what was the role played by the fixed cost. Like qualitatively, it didn't seem that you need it. Maybe it matters for the calibration of the model. It would be easier for me. To, I mean, maybe, you know, you want to have a general model of uncertainty, so maybe you want to have a, you know, an option effect there. I just didn't understand why it mattered. And the same with the optimal contracting problem. I thought it was really nice that you can actually solve it in closed form, but I feel like maybe this could be postponed to the appendix and just say, look, each agent is forced to hold a fraction fee of the firm. See the appendix for that. And that's partly because this is not the main point you're trying to make, and I think having it there kind of obscures the main message. In fact, I actually think it's interesting to write a separate paper where you think about how the optimal contracting problem would change for firms that were more cash cow firms or more growth firms. And you can have different implications about structure of executive pay as a function of the type of the firm. But I think you know, th that would be a separate, completely separate exercise. A minor quibble, you may want to rethink the calibration. I mean, in the model, the volatility of investment growth is 55% per year. That's pretty high. And also the correlation between investment consumption is like minus 50. That's not kind of what we see in the data. So you may want to kind of, I think what you're doing is you're targeting net investment, which is investment net of depreciation, but that object can become negative. So it's not clear that's the right object to target. Another, my last point in the 60 seconds that I have, I'm going to skip this. Um, what I'd like you to think about is kind of think more carefully how the model maps to reality. Like, who are these experts? Who do you have in mind? Are these managers? Are these entrepreneurs? Are these venture capitalists? Is this private equity? Who are these people that are both marginal in pricing assets and they're sufficiently rich for, to matter for the pricing of these shocks? And the other thing is it'd be nice to have a more direct measure of growth uncertainty, but I think for that, it's helpful to think of what, what it really means. Like, what exactly are these firm-specific shocks that are completely IID and are drawn every period? Is this some, does this something that include financing costs? Is that how we want to think about these things? Is that it includes not just the productivity of new projects, but also the cost of raising money? And, okay, so these are kind of my high-level comments, and I think answering these questions will kind of help you provide more 
direct tests on the model. And I have zero minutes left, so I'll 